Amen. Good to be with you here tonight. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. The title of my message tonight that I'd like to share with you from God's Word is Running God's Race for God's Glory. Let me say that again. Running God's Race for God's Glory. As we just did a minute ago, let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray for this time. Father in heaven, we come before you, a needy people. For you are the vine and we are the branches. And Father, we come with expectation because we know we're coming to your word. And just like you fed the Israelites in the wilderness through your manna, so Father, we come hungry, with hungry souls to be fed from your word. Father, we ask that you would do your work by your spirit, that you would illuminate our hearts to receive your word, knowing that your word does not return to you void, but accomplishes your purpose. And Father, I pray that you would use these stammering lips of clay, that there would be nothing in my life that would get in the way of the message of the Word of God. Father, we pray for anybody here that does not know you as Savior. And Father, may tonight be the night of salvation for them. We pray for a heavy heart that is out there tonight that is struggling in life's decisions and circumstances. Father, I pray that you would take those things and obliterate them because you are the great God. And so, Father, we come and we thank you and we praise you. We ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it truly is a privilege to be with you here tonight. And uh, I just covet your prayers. Uh, Tomorrow I'm going to be flying out to sunny Nebraska. And uh, it's actually uh, the church of one of the students that came through here at Grace. And they're having a youth conference there. And so I'm going to go and take a few days and preach out there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, Stephen Chevron, some of you may remember him. Uh, He had an older brother, Mike Chevron, and the Chevrons were here at Grace for a while. And so I'm looking forward to flying southwest. I say looking forward. I just want to get there. And uh, so uh, pray for me as I go up there. But I I can tell you, as a youth minister, that is one of the joys of ministry. Is, is getting a little older and seeing some of these young men and women that, are, that have grown up in the church, and whether they're far from us or serving in the church right here with us, what a joy it is to see them serve. And so I thank the Lord for that. Please pray that God would use and encourage hearts through the preaching and teaching of His Word. And, you know, I, I, I think about that uh, encouragement and... Uh, my son, he's out at the wilds. You pray for us as Finleys. We are adjusting to having five instead of six in our home. And Jeremiah, he's out there cooking. He's getting burns and all kinds of grease on him. And uh, he's doing well. But he calls us nightly and he tells us about his day and how tired he is. And uh, I'm like, yeah, the wilds is going to get it out of you. And you're going to be tired no matter what camp, no matter what you're doing. Camp is just a tiring thing. But today he was, or yesterday, he was uh, talking to us on the phone, and someone came by and said, Jeremiah Finley? And he said, yeah. And he says, hey, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Tim Block. And uh, Tim Block was there and went by and saw my son and was able to encourage him, shake his hand, say, hey, I'm proud of you. And uh, I don't think Tim knew it, but we were on the phone, my wife and I, and, and our hearts were just so rejoicing. You know, to be encouraged by mom and dad is one thing. To be encouraged by someone else is completely different. And so we were just so thankful for what God is doing in the hearts and lives of people. Well, I am going to ask you to do this, but if you'll just take a moment and please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Don't worry, you'll sit in just a moment, but please stand for the Word of God as we read it and as you follow along. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Wherefore, seeing we are also encompassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin." You may be seated. May the Lord add his richest blessing to the reading of his word. 
What an incredible passage. What an incredible book. But before we jump into Hebrews chapter 12, let me just give you a few preliminary thoughts. And the first being the author of this book. You know, when we look at other books, we see right off from the beginning in the salutation that usually the human author mentions their name. And this is the debate of many scholars as they think about who possibly could have written the book of Hebrews. And there's many suggestions out there. Paul, Apollos, Luke, and even Peter. And these are some of the suggestions from maybe the authors that have penned the book of Hebrews. But God in his infinite grace and sovereignty, for whatever reason, does not allow us to know the human author of this book. But it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. And so, yes, there are those that believe and they have their camps of who they believe that has written this. But you know, it suffices us to know that God veiled that human author and wants us to focus on the message being directly delivered to us from God. And we can have confidence in that message. And this was going to be a message that was needed. Because not only do we see the author, but we see the audience. Primarily, the book of Hebrews was written to a Jewish audience who had become believers. And they were now facing intense persecution. Unlike us today, they were really facing persecution for what they believed. They were coming out of Judaism and now they were standing out and oftentimes standing alone against the onslaught of persecution. We get a little bit of a taste of this in the book of Acts. But the audience is going through intense persecution. And let me just say, my friends, we face persecution in a little bit of a different way today. But we face difficult circumstances in our life. Maybe it's at the workplace. Maybe it's taking a stand for something in the places where you are living or the place that you work. And not only do we see the authorship, not only do we see the audience that's targeted here being the Jewish believers, but we also see the aim. The aim of this book and the author reminds that God's goal for the audience is to show that Jesus is better. I like the saying, you probably heard it, never let it rest to the good get better and the better get best. And the author, his aim is to show the Jewish struggling, excuse me, the Christian believers who are Jewish, is they are struggling to stand up for the Lord and he wants to encourage them and remind them that Jesus is better. You know what, let's say that together, Jesus is better. And he begins to do this in kind of almost like an attorney would. He's showing Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than any ritual circumcision. Jesus is better than angels. And he's getting them to think in that line that Jesus is the best. And so the author is God, the audience are struggling believers, and the aim is to point them clearly that Jesus is better. But as we come to Hebrews chapter 12, we can see the very clear analogy of a race. And by the way, it was not just a race that they were running, and Paul used a lot of athletic metaphors and analogies, and here he's using one about a race that each and every one of us must run. Now, when you were younger, you probably remembered in elementary school running that 100-meter dash. Probably at the end of the year when a track and field day came around, came around, and everybody was seeing who's the fastest in the class. And you would run that 100 meters and hopefully win a ribbon for first, second, or third, or maybe you were like me, fifth or something. But you would run that race, and you would try to be the fast, fastest you can be. And you know, as you got a little older, well, those lengths increase. You now have 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, 26.4 miles. But have you heard of these things called ultra marathons? These things are incredible, 152 miles. 
They're colorfully named the Spartathlon in Greece, which is about 152 miles. They also have one in Peru called the Jungle Ultra, where the danger is not only a 100% humidity, but the wild animals you may encounter while running. Then they also have, finally, the Badwater Ultra Marathon in Death Valley. I don't know, but that scares me right from the beginning. Not only the length of the race, but you're running in Death Valley. 135 miles of some of the most rugged terrain and the hottest temperatures. Very hostile to the runner. But you know, no matter the distance, whether it's a sprint or the ultra marathon, there are, there are really an opportunity for you and I to run the race for God's glory. And why? Because I don't know if you heard it, but when you got saved, when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, my friend, that gun went off. And you are now running that race for God's glory. And let me just remind you that the first step you ever took was justification. That's where God declared you righteousness, not because of your good works, but because of what Jesus Christ had done for you on Calvary. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. The only thing we bring is our sin to salvation. And that's what makes it so wonderful and so glorious. But now as we start that race, we understand like a Christian did as he was running that race in Pilgrim's Progress, that we are challenged on our faith. We are challenged by issues and really what we come to understand is we are sanctified. We are set apart for God's honor and glory. I like putting this in my, the minds and hearts of my, my children as we sit down for dinner each night or as many times as we can. And we say that verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's eating and drinking i got to make sure I surely am running for his honor and glory. But you and I, once we get saved, we are set apart for his honor and his glory. And then as we're set apart in running that race, and I'm not talking about perfection. Please don't get me wrong. I'm talking about a mindset. I'm talking about a lifestyle. Because we do all want to hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into joy today. What we don't want to hear is depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I have never known you. But didn't we do great things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do that? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I have never known you. So as we look at this race that we are to run, man, that makes a lot of noise when I drink that. <laughs> As we look at the first point of this, let me just remind you, running God's race by remembering God's faithfulness. That's the first clear point. Running God's race by remembering God's faithfulness. A preparation for race by being encouraged. I was at River Valley Ranch one time running a race, and it was getting towards the end. My father-in-law had long been against me, uh, long flown past me, John Cool, and I was running the race, and I was dragging. And we were getting towards the end, and there were all these people sitting on the side, and they're like... And so I'm running, and I'm like, hey, can I get some encouragement? Hey, can I, can you... It's almost over. Can you say something to me? And they were like, yeah, way to go. You look awful, you know. And, and they were trying to encourage me. And I'm thinking to myself, it's almost over. I think I can. I think I can. It's almost over. And as I kept on going and, and plodding along, you know, the intense persecution that these believers were under, it starts off in verse 1, wherefore? Wherefore? And what is the author intent to do? He's intending, as they take that next step forward, to look back and to consider those that have gone on before them. Hebrews 11 is called the Hall of Faith. It gives some of the greatest examples of faith. It gives a great definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1, let me just remind you. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. 
Verse 3, through faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that things that which were seen were not made of the things which do appear. And then we have three tremendous examples. First of all, we see Abel. Abel was a man who offered, a, he worshipped, excuse me, his, he worshipped by faith. We know that there were two in the beginning that were told to bring an offering. One was Cain and one was Abel. The older brother brought an offering of his hands. And then Abel brought the offering that God had prescribed, that sacrifice. And really, that's what Hebrews does. You know, Romans goes from law to grace. Hebrews goes from uh, shadow to substance. And just as Abel offered that blood sacrifice to atone, to cover that sin... There was one that was coming that was much greater, and that name was Jesus, the sinless one that would hang on the cross and die and say, it is finished, and the sin was finished, done. It's a beautiful picture. Abel worshipped by faith. But then you have Enoch. He walked by faith. Enoch walked by faith. In verse 5, it says, in faith... By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. One minute here, the next minute not. And because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had the testimony, and listen to this, that he pleased God. You ever thought about that? When you're walking with God, you can't be walking in the opposite direction. You've got to be walking in the same direction. So, of course, Enoch is going to please God. Such a small little portion of Scripture is dedicated to Enoch, but what an incredible testimony for God. Enoch walked by faith. And then we have this beautiful verse in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. As in my devotions, I was just being reminded the other day in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What, the riches of the world? No. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The things that you'll never be able to buy with money. The things that only can be given to you by God and will never be able to manufacture in a test tube. Because that's in the realm of God. And then finally you have Noah who worked by faith. You have one that worships, one that walks, and one that works by faith. As he slowly built that ark. Each of them had challenges daily as they took that step forward by faith for the glory of God. And the author here is wherefore, he's reminding them of these incredible, as we turn back to chapter 12, he's reminding of them of this, this group that has encompassed them, that they can look back and they can reflect. I remember in fifth grade, my, my mom had surgery, and so my dad did what any dad would do. He shipped us off to camp. And it was in Canton, Ohio. And before we went to Jack Lambert football camp, which, you know, Jack Lambert was a part of the Iron Curtain, the Pittsburgh Steelers' Iron Curtain. They were a dominating defense. But before we went to the camp, my dad took us to Canton, the Football Hall of Fame. Now, I was just a little kid, but I remember walking around and I remember seeing greats like Jim Brown. I remember seeing uh, Vince Lombardi in this, this, not him actually, but his, his statue. And looking at my dad and saying, that's great. These individuals established their greatness on the football field. But the author is saying, look to those that have established themselves in faith to God. And by the way, I can't really give them credit because it was God working in them and God working in you and me. Because we are faithless, he is faithful. And let me emphasize the fall. Because that's where God is. We tend to be spiritually self-inflicting ourselves all the time. But when we think about this great cloud of witness, Jesus reminds us that this is not easy believism. Matthew 6, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's not a matter of if you're going to face trials and temptation. It's when. And these believers were doing, and these believers that the book of Hebrews was aimed towards, they were going through difficult times. But it makes me ask this question of you and me. What kind of faith do we have? James clearly in chapter 2, verses 14, 15, 16, all the way to 19, clearly talks about three different types of faith. There's dead faith. I don't believe at all. That's dead faith. There's demon faith. 
You know, you look at the interaction between the demons and Jesus, and oftentimes the, Jesus, the demons testify to who Jesus was. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They gave great testimonies, the demons did, with fear and trembling. But they hated Jesus and were against him. That's demon faith. That's listening and hearing and then walking away. That's demon faith. But then the last one is dynamic faith, which we just talked about and just saw very evidence by three individuals and more through the book of through chapter 11. I like what Vance Havner said, whether the weather be cold or whether the weather be hot, whether the weather be good or whether the weather be not, whatever the weather we weather the weather, whether we like it or not. That's a lot of weathers. But it's ideal. We're going through it. We're going to face it. And faith is the key. So preparation for the race of being encouraged, but also preparation for the race by being untangled. Because the second part of Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside, look what he's going to say, weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience, that word also endurance, the race that is set before us. God is setting a race before you. God has a purpose for your life. But that purpose is not necessarily the purpose. That purpose is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. It's interesting the difference that he uses here, the author. He says, wait and sin. Now, let me, let me differentiate between these two. Sin is homardia. We know that. It's clear violation of God's word. You have crossed the Rubicon. You have stepped over the line. You have violated God's commandment, God's word, God's will. But the weight, that's a little bit more tricky. The weight, that's something that may be good in the beginning, but begins to hinder you in your walk with God. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's a priority. Maybe it's a bunch of letters in front of your name. Maybe it's a bank account. Maybe it's a house. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. It's something that started out good and now is hindering you. You were on fire, but something took the place of that love, that passion for God. And you know, that's really the fuel of our faith is our love for God. Our, excuse me, I should say obedience is our love, is fueled by the love for God. That's why we obey. It's not grievous. And so here the author is saying, cast those things aside. Put them off. Do you know when I used to run, we would do something called a warm-up. And we only ran three miles, but we would, uh, we would run six miles in warm-up. And we would take all these I mean, I'd have three layers on me. And we're running, and we're sweating, and we're heating up our muscles. But my friend, then it came race time. And I tell you, it was embarrassing. Because we took off all these layers. And we had these short shorts, these nylon things. It was embarrassing. And then we had these, these tank tops that were like, it, it, was, it, was, it was flimsy. And then we used to tie them in the back with tape. Because we wanted nothing to hinder our movement. Let me ask you, my friend, what's hindering your spiritual movement for God? What's getting in the way? Maybe it's a weight. Maybe it's a sin. Confess it and forsake it. I loved what Reverend Earl was saying, Reverend Johnson was saying this weekend when he said, turn, pivot, turn the other way. And that idea is so true. Weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Know ye not that we which run in a race run all, but one receiveth a prize, so run that you may obtain. Remember, we are not to run a purpose-driven life, but a person-driven life, because we're following after Christ. And where he leads, we will follow. Towards the end of verse 12, there's the word race. It's actually a, a Greek word, and here's what it means in English, Agony. The, the flesh says, stop, but the spirit cries, never. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to go. And you find in this world so many people deconstructing. And I'm walking around. They went out from us because they were not of us. 
continue in the things that thou hast learned. But I'm strong enough. I, I don't need to go to church. I don't, I don't need the fellowship. Oh, my friend, you're the target. Satan is just loving you. Yeah, I got you. Stay home. Yeah, you don't need that fellowship. What are you doing? Don't rob other people of the fellowship that you have. It's glorious. And so that word race is agony. And we're going to have struggles just like they had struggles. So we recognize running God's race by remembering God's faithfulness. But also we see running God's race with a riveted focus on Christ. Hebrews 2 goes on, 12, 2, and says in that verse, looking unto Jesus. I love this. This is my favorite part. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Remember, if your faith fizzles from the, uh, excuse me, remember if your faith fizzles before the finish, it was flawed from the first. I got the other one out, but that was kind of hard, all right? <laughs> you know what, as you're a Christian, you're going to take a lot. You're going to have betrayal. You're going to have some people. You know, I, I, I really struggle with people to say, you know, those churches are filled with hypocrites. Of course it is. It's what the church should be filled with. It's like going to a workout club and there are overweight people there. I applaud them. I applaud them. That's where they need to be. Even the disciples didn't go to Jesus, Jesus. I can't follow you anymore. Judas, Judas, I, I can't follow you because of Judas. We need to put the excuses aside and look unto Jesus. There's plenty of distractions around us. There's plenty of things that are around us. But as we recognize, as we focus on Jesus during the race, first of all, he's the focus of our faith. We can't get our eyes on many other things. We need to focus, stop comparing other things in the world he is our focus. That's a riveted gaze. But then also, he is the founder of our faith. The word is used to describe Christ as the prince or ruler. And other passages refer to Christ as the author or the founder. He is the core. He is the center. And my friend, if you put anything in that middle, you're doomed. I know. I went to public high school. Man, I tell you what, I understood why people did what they did. That's a sinner. I'm saved. ha, ha, ha. I understood why they did what they did. And then I went to Christian college, and I sat there, and I'm looking around. I'm like, what are these people doing? And it was very hard because I started to get my eyes on people, and they failed me. And I started to get my eyes on teachers, and they failed me. I started to get my eyes on people, and they'll fail you. But Jesus never fails. All to him I owe. Jesus never fails. Keep your eyes on him. He's the founder, and he deserves that focus. But also, he's the finisher of our faith. And I'll tell you why. Because it says at the end of verse 2 that he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know why that's significant? You know, in the tabernacle, they never had any seats. The priests were always ministering. They're always sacrificing. They're always sprinkling. They're always atoning. That's what they do. They're priests. They never sat down. But because the sacrifice would never be over. It was never over. But hapax, that word once Jesus offered and sacrificed and atoned for our sin. And now he is finished. Our salvation is secure and he's sitting down. That's a boss move. He's sitting down. He's the finisher of our faith. He's the founder of our faith and he's the focus of our faith. Running God's race, remembering God's faithfulness, running God's race with riveted focus on Christ and then running God's race with reckoned footsteps for Christ. For consider him that endures such contradiction. Consider him then endure such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. You know what? When you were growing up and you're going through a difficult day, didn't your parent try to encourage you? Yeah, when I had to go to school, I had to walk uphill three miles in the rain, no shoes, up a icy hill. And they're trying to encourage you by the things that they went through. And that's kind of what the author is doing here. The author is saying, consider Whenever you face difficulty, whenever you're challenged, consider what Christ went through. 
And you are sinful, but he was sinless. And yet the Bible says that he uttered not a word, but he took it. And why did he take it? For you and for me. That should well up within our lives such a compassion and a desire to obey him no matter what. And not obey what the pundits are saying. Not obey. I, I, I just love Rahab. Joshua chapter 2 with her son's called Love Rahab. Race, place, it didn't matter. She just, she just had an unwavering faith. And you think about Rahab. She took that cord, that thread, and she hung it out by faith of her room. And that was a symbol to remind that when Joshua and the enemies and the, the Israel came in, that everyone that was in that house where that cord of th- that scarlet thread was hanging out was saved. And running God's race with reckoned footsteps for Christ, consider reckon what he has done. That yes, it is difficult. And yes, we go through difficult times. But it's nothing compared to what Jesus went through. Do you know what, my friend, when we are having our pity parties, I've had them. I've sent out invites. <laughs> we need to consider, reckon what he did. And then if we reckon what he did and what he went through, it helps us to understand that, yes, we may be going through some difficult stuff, but he goes through it with us. So we're in the book of Joshua in Sunday school, and so I was just meditating on that verse the other day in Joshua chapter 1, 9. Have I not said, be strong and courageous? Be not afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And I want to remind you that if you are going to run this race for God's glory, then he is going to have to be all the things that we've talked about tonight. As you think about considering the past and those that have gone before you, focusing on him and taking that next step for God. You know, let me just show you this visually. Our stance should never be side by side with God because we're easily tipped over when we do that. We're not to be side by side with Christ because then when the difficulty and the circumstances, we're still trusting in ourselves. Here's how we should stand. Christ should always be first. And as he is first, we're able to dip behind that, uh, that shield of faith and we're able to endure whatever comes our way. Not because of us. We're not that great. I'm not that great. Okay? But Christ is great and he's able to help us weather whatever we go through. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this wonderful night. I thank you for the word. And I ask that you will bless um, the message here today. Maybe there's someone that's sitting out there and they don't have dynamic faith. They have dead or demon faith, but they need dynamic faith. And they will simply say, Father God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. My friend, I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to sit up here and plead. I'm not going to do that. Spirit of God's going to touch your heart and draw you unto himself. You know what you're talking about. You've been, you've been, you've been eating the cotton candy of this world. You, you've been, you've been sque- squeezing that dry sand through your hand and it just constantly eludes you. It slips through. And what you need is you need Christ. Oh, my friend, would you repent of your sin and receive Jesus as your Savior? And Father, for those that are sitting out there with heavy hearts, Father, I pray that you would Meet the need of their heart. Maybe, maybe their focus has been on other people. Maybe their focus has been on the, the news. Oh, maybe their focus has been on something other than you. And what they need to do is that it's not a salvation issue. It's an obedience issue. They need to get their eyes on you. They need to start having the devotions like they once had. They need to start praying like they once did. And reconnecting you in a new and dynamic way relationship. Father, we thank you so much. What a loving church I have an opportunity to preach and be a part of. And Father, we just ask your richest blessing upon your word. May you go from this time, not being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you.